Hello dear students, hope you're doing well. Today we have section number two, in which we'll talk about matter and its properties. First, let's define what is matter. Uh, matter is anything that has mass and it takes up space. Okay, so we have two conditions for something to be called matter. It should have mass. Okay, how many kilograms, how many grams, milligrams do we have? And it should have volume. Volume meaning that it should take up space. For example, anything around you, it's matter. For example, a rock is matter. Mass is the measure of the amount of matter. How much matter is inside an object, we call it mass. What do you measure it with? The unit is kilograms, grams, it depends on how uh, big the object is. Volume, on the other hand, is the amount of three-dimensional space an object occupies. Okay, so the dimensions, you just multiply them to get the volume depending on the shape. Uh, for example, for liquids, it's different than if it is a solid, let's say. We have many units. These are some examples. So let's go to basic building blocks of matter. Now we have defined what matter is. We have two conditions. Then what is matter made up of? So the fundamental building blocks of matter, the, there are atoms and molecules, okay? Atoms, know that atoms are smaller than molecules. Molecule is more than one atom combined together, okay? So an atom is the smallest unit of an element that maintains the chemical identity of that element. Then what is an element? An element is a pure substance made up of only one kind of atom. I'm sure you have heard many, many elements in your life. For example, carbon is an element, oxygen is an element, hydrogen is an element. Look, the type of atoms that we have, all of them are identical. For carbon, all of them are atoms of carbon. For oxygen, all of them are atoms of oxygen, hydrogen, and other elements as well. On the other hand, a compound, it consists of more than one type of atom bonded together. So we call it a compound. So a compound is a substance that is made up of atoms of two or more different elements that are chemically bonded together. Let's take an example. For example, water, H2O. It is made up of two different elements, hydrogen and oxygen. Okay, And we have two hydrogens bonded to one oxygen okay so now we know how many different elements we have in water and how many atoms of each element they combine to form this molecule of this compound which is water okay this water it is we said made up of hydrogen and oxygen in nature hydrogen is a gas oxygen is also a gas but water it's a liquid at normal conditions, of course. So look, they have different properties. So depending on the type of element that are present in compounds, when they combine together to form this compound, they have different properties, chemical and physical properties. So what is a molecule? The basic unit of a compound. So it's the smallest unit of an element or a compound that retains all the properties of that element or a compound, so different properties. For example, if you have a glass of water, we have molecules of water present, okay? We do not have hydrogen separately and oxygen separately. No, we have a molecule of water. Each one of them is separate. So this together is a glass of water. So let's go to the difference between element and compound. The basic unit of elements, there are atoms for compounds is a molecule. Elements, they consist of only one type of atom. Molecules or compounds, molecules of compounds, they consist of more than one element bonded together. In elements, we do not have a bond between them because it's only made up of one thing. For compounds, no, we have a bond between them because we have more than one element bonded together. Examples of elements, you can take any example, the ones that we have mentioned, oxygen, carbon, hydrogen. For compounds, water, sugar is a compound, methane is a compound. Okay. So we have this question. Why do scientists or chemists use properties of matter? What do you use them for? For example, they use them to distinguish between substances and to separate them. 
So we have, for example, an unknown. Okay, we do not know what this substance is, but we have some of its properties. We see that it is shiny, that it conducts electricity, that it is a solid. All of these properties indicate that it should be a metal. So from the properties, we know what type of element or a compound we have in this unknown. So how many types of properties do we have? We have two. We have extensive and in intensive. So extensive properties, they depend on how much matter is inside an object. Intensive, no, they do not depend. So they are constant no matter how much object uh, is big. It's still the same thing, so it's constant. For example, volume, mass, the amount of energy substances they have, all of these are extensive, so they depend. So, for example, the bigger an object is, for example, we have ice, the bigger is the volume. The smaller the object is, the smaller is the volume. On the other hand, for intensive properties, we have melting point, boiling point, density, conductivity, and other properties as well, but these are the common ones. These, they are constant. It does not matter how big the object is. These do not change. For example, the melting point of water is 0 Celsius. So it starts to melt at 0 Celsius. No matter how big or small the ice cube is, it still starts at 0 Celsius. For example, another example is boiling point. The boiling point is 100, no matter how big or small the object is, it is still 100 because this ice cube, both of them, they are made up of the same thing. So all of these are constant. That's for intensive. For extensive, no, it changes. This only tells us one thing is, for example, if we have an unknown and we do not have anything known for this thing or any property given to us, what can we do to identify what the substance or what the unknown is? We can just, for example, measure the melting point, measure the boiling point, for example, measure density, conductivity, then compare them. For example, if it is, let's say, zero, it should be water, right? If it is more than zero, less than zero, we can just search it and we'll know what the object is. Let's go to physical and chemical properties or changes. Let's talk about them or the differences between them. First, what is a physical property? It's anything that you can observe or measure, measure without changing the identity of the substance. Okay? For example, the color of an object, you observe it, you see that the color, for example, is white, of this board is white, without changing anything in this board, right? So that's a physical property. Other examples including melting point, boiling point, and so on. You know that melting point is changing from solid to liquid, boiling point from liquid to gas. We'll talk about this later on. What about a physical change? So these are physical properties, things you just observe them, but physical changes, you're changing the object, but without changing the identity. For example, if you're cutting something, for example, you have a piece of paper, you cut it into two halves, it's still a paper, right? So this, cutting this paper, it's a physical property. Grinding, crushing, melting, boiling, all of these are physical properties. You have to know something that changes of state, all of them are physical properties. What do you mean by changes of state? Yeah, you changing from solid to liquid, liquid to gas, or the exact opposite. These are all the processes from solid to liquid, that's melting, liquid to gas, boiling, from liquid back to solid, freezing, gas back to liquid, condensation. These are the four common ones. We have uh, other two examples, which is solid directly into gas sublimation, gas directly into solid deposition. Next, we have states of matter. We have three main states of matter, which is solid, liquid, gas. The fourth one, which is not that common, it's plasma, and this is the definition. Let's talk about the solid, liquid, and gas and the differences between them. First, you have to know, for solid, everything is constant. So volume is constant, does not change. Shape is constant, does not change. The, vo the movement, it only vibrates, but you cannot see it. Attraction forces, 
If you look at the shape, the particles are close to each other, so they, they have strong attraction forces. Okay, So there is basically a small amount of distance between this particle and another particle right beside it. On the other hand, liquids, they have constant volume, but the shape changes depending on what, depending on the container that they are in. Now what about the movement? They move more than solids, so the type of movement that they have, it flows. What about the traction forces? If you look at the shape, the particles are a bit away from each other, more than solids, so they have weaker attraction forces. For gases, it's the exact opposite, so they have more distance between them. It means that they have the weakest attraction forces. Here, everything changes for gases. They do not have a defined volume, so it changes. And they do not have a defined shape, it changes. And they move very rapidly without even stopping. Uh, no matter what the shape of the container the gas is in, they take the shape of this container. For example, if you have oxygen gas, you put it inside, let's say, this container, it will take the shape of this container because it constantly moves. If you have a bigger container, another shape, again, it will take the shape of this container because it moves freely. And that's for physical changes and uh, the three states of matter. For chemical properties and chemical changes, the exact opposite for physical, nothing was changing, you're not changing the identity. Here for chemical properties, you're changing the identity, so something is changing into something new. For example, you have charcoal, it reacts with oxygen to form carbon dioxide, and you think, I run with oxygen, if you leave it outside, it rusts, right? So this rust is a new thing. Silver, if you react it with sulfur, it tarnishes. Okay, so the silvery appearance disappears. That's a new thing being formed. So these are chemical pro properties. What about chemical changes? Again, changing the identity or changing from something into something new. The thing that we had, we call it reactant, which is the old thing. It changes into something new. We call it product, which is on your right side of the equation. That's a new thing. For example, if this, the question gives you this equation, it asks you to identify which one of them is reactant, which one of them is the product. Just look at here. You're sitting on this arrow and look. On the left side, we have reactants. It could be one, could be more than one, it depends. And on your right side, we have products. We only have one product here. We have two reactants here. Same thing goes here. Look, on your left side, we have reactants. On your right side, we have two products. We have to know something that whenever we have a physical or a chemical change that occurs, there is always energy involved. Sometimes it is absorbed, sometimes it is released, depending on the reaction and what do they need. Energy can take several forms, but the two common ones are heat and light, especially in chemical reactions. But we have something which is the law of conservation of mass. Yes, it absorbs energy, it releases energy, but you have to know that energy can neither be created or destroyed. It can only be transferred from one form into another one. So it is constant. Energy is constant, it does not change. The last thing we have, which is the classification of matter. How many types do we have? We have matter is divided into mixtures and pure substances. Mixtures, when we have more than one thing combined together, pure substance is only one thing, okay, which has a fixed composition. I need the percentage for each thing inside this pure substance, it's constant. For example, if we have a glass of water, only water, we know exactly how, mo how many atoms of hydrogen we have and how many atoms of oxygen. So that's a pure substance. But for example, if I have a glass of water and I put salt inside, so more than one thing combined, that's a mixture. Okay. And mixtures, there are two types. Homogeneous, yeah, the old parts are the same thing, they are uniform, for example, salt in water, the saltiness of this glass of water is the same here, 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 everywhere. So it's a homogeneous mixture. Heterogeneous, on the other hand, old parts are not the same thing. For example, 
clay in water. We might have big clumps at the bottom of the flask and a clear liquid above. So that's heterogeneous. Pure substances can only be compounds and elements and we only already talked about elements and compounds and the differences between them. For example, if let's say we have a mixture, we want to separate it. Look at pure substances, compounds and elements, you cannot separate it into more than one thing by physical means, especially elements. Compounds, you can this you can separate it into hydrogen and oxygen by chemical means, not physically, only chemically. But mixtures you can separate them by physical means, and without changing the identity of the substance. We have few methods, the ones that are mentioned in your book. We have three. Filtration, when we have something solid in a liquid. Let's say we have sand in water. You want to separate it, we use filtration. Centrifuge, it's specifically for blood. Whenever you want to get a test for your blood, they use centrifuge to separate components of blood. So solid components from the liquid part of the blood. The last thing is paper chromatography. This is specifically for uh, pigments, dyes, pigments, anything with color in it. For example, ink, for example, uh, leaves of flowers and stuff. Okay, You want to separate them into their components into their colors, you use paper chromatography. Okay, so this was it for the second section. I know it was a bit long, so you do not have to just watch it in one session. Try to divide it into more than one day. Uh, and I will see you later on.